Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak wa an'im ala abdihi wa rasulihi al-Ameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul aqadatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Insha'Allah ta'ala we're just going to go for about maybe 30 minutes insha'Allah I know that uh, last night was probably a very busy night and uh, we're, we're getting close to, to iftar but I want to remind myself and you all of some beautiful uh, benefits, inshallah ta'ala. And these benefits, as we should understand, that some of them are confined to Ramadan, but many of them are universal, being that they stand, withstand within Ramadan, and they are also universal principles that should be maintained and executed outside of Ramadan. The first thing I want to remind you all before going into the topic is Always remember that Ramadan should serve as a catalyst for you. Ramadan should not be something that is seasonal. It should be something that is a catalyst. It is a starting point for you for a new habit that you want to implement or something that you want to leave off. And Ramadan should be the catapult for that. It shouldn't be something to where you go into Ramadan and you say, okay, I'm going to do this for about 30 days and inshallah I'm going to be done. Just as the fasting is 30 days and everything that goes along with the fasting, the good, and the bad and the ugly, right, will be in this 30 days and everything after that, inshallah, will be back to the way that it was before Ramadan. But we should actually look at this as the starting point for a new process of our Islamic development, a new process of our implementation, a new process of being a better human being. And that, obviously, but to remind ourselves, it does not stand only within the masjid and within our homes. It's outside in the world to where we're amongst our co-workers and amongst our friends, they're well aware of why we don't eat for lunch. They're well aware of why we may leave off an argument even if we feel that we're right. They're well aware of the fact that if they see us, we look kind of distraught because we're hungry. They understand that it's a spiritual struggle that we're going through, but it's for the betterment of our own selves and for the people around us. So just to remind ourselves that this month is that, and especially in these last 10 days, to start with in some of the benefits of the last 10 days that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wife mentioned Aisha Radiallahu Anha the hadith there were three things that she said he did who knows those three things that she said she said when it was when it was uh, the last 10 days he would do three things he would, he would tighten, uh, he tighten his garment uh -huh. he, he would waken his family at night and No. That's another hadith On Aisha Yes, very good So the first thing you said He said that what He would tighten his garment Okay Which is an expression of what? What did that express? Do your best. Wake up his family No, we said Shadda mi'zarahu mada Yani qastu dhalik al-ibara Mada Yani shadda mi'zarahu Yani mada What does that mean when he Tightened his garment? Aywa, yani ijtihad. Wa baadum kala anhu aish taraka alhu, yani min ma yufal bi ahli. So some of them said that it was mada. It was what that it was. He would have his undivided attention. He would really concentrate on Ramadan. Shut the mitzaro, like he would tighten up, roll up his sleeves, right? He was serious, especially in the last ten days. That should automatically, even before going on to the other two, that should automatically tell you the seriousness. And the virtue of the 10 nights within the 30. So other than the 20, these 10, there's something different about them. Automatically, just that one part. Then it also said what? Ahya laylatuhu, and that's the third one, that's the one. He said he would liven his night. His night would be live. It would be full of effort and worship, of effort within worship. Effort and making efforts of worship. So praying, making dhikr, right? Reading the Quran. His night would be livened by this. So when we think about livening our nights in Ramadan, just put the mirror on yourself. When we say reflections, when we say reflect, you see in the mirror it's a reflection. So let's have a indirect or a, a, a spiritual reflection of when the night time comes, what are we doing in these last 10 days? 
Sometimes we may get mixed up. Mashallah, it's a brother I haven't seen in a while. And the brother may be making it to Kaf and you're not. But then you find yourself 30 minutes within your dialogue talking about something for the past 20 minutes that has nothing to do with increasing your spirituality. What's up? You're talking about the dunya. You're talking about sometimes, many times as converts, people that convert to Islam, they'll talk about jahiliyyah. They'll talk about what they did before Islam. Right? Or we may talk about somebody or something. You know, we may talk about the elections and what's going on and how that affects the Muslims around the world. But are you using that as a catalyst and as a means to bring you back to the remembrance of Allah to where when you're done with that, you say, oh, subhanAllah. Then you get up and you pray to Rakats and you ask Allah to protect you, your family, the Muslims around the world. You at least make dua. You see? So, ahya laylatuhu. That's the second. And the third was, aqadha ahlahu. And he would wake his family up. For those of you that are not making i'tikaf, for those of you that are at home, if you find yourself when you make tarawih, you're lethargic. Then don't make tarawih. Go home, sleep early, wake up around 2, 3 o'clock. Wake your family up. Wake your children up. They're not at the age of praying. Wake them up anyway. Wake them up and let them, because if they're not at the age of praying, when they're at the age of five, six, seven, they see that the last 10 days of Ramadan, dad is not doing what he usually does. It's something weird. That's what you want them to say. So when the third, fourth year comes around, they're like, oh, this is the last 10 days of Ramadan. That's why he's waking up at two, three in the morning. Right? Oh, it's the month of Ramadan. That's why, I can't, why, why he's waking up, you know, an hour before Fajr and, and, you know, wanting to have a big breakfast. You want them to have this experience to where they're used to it. Then that's when you take the opportunity to, to explain to them, you know why we do this? When they, reach the age, when they reach that age of praying, even though they heard it before, but when that time comes around, when they reach the age of 10 to where they have to pray, and they need to have that in their conscious mind that on a daily basis, I got to pray five times a day. When I reach the age of 15, it's obligatory upon me. You see how Allah conditions within the Sharia, within the deen of Islam, Allah conditions you to where when you're obliged to do it, it's not so thaqilan, it's not so heavy upon you to where you don't want to do it. And we're going to talk about that inshallah. So that's what Aisha radiallahu anha has said, those three things. Those three things, ihfadha, memorize them. His wife said that when the last 10 days came in, he would tighten his garment, he would live in his night and he would awaken his family. He would awaken his family. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said to, 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 to work hard and exert yourself in the last 10 days. It's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be. Sleeping in the masjid and making it to kaf, it's not going to be easy. When coming and making it to kaf, what is your purpose? Are you bringing your whole wardrobe to the masjid? You bring different kinds of soaps and different kinds of perfumes and or are you coming to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You want to just concentrate on life. And when I say concentrate on life, it's the same as saying thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when we say life, isn't life just a conglomeration of God's actions upon you? Everything that happens is with God's what? His what? His qadr, his predestination. Nothing goes outside of what Allah wants, period. So when we think about life, it is the af'alullah alayna. It is the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us and others than us. From animate objects being ourselves and inanimate being this rug, being any animal, any insect, everything is from the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when one ponders upon that on a consistent basis, this brings forth something else. And that's what I want to advise you all in these last 10 days and beyond in general, but these last 10 days in specific for those of you that are making itikaf and those of you that are not. Are three things. Read, reflect, and repent. To read, to reflect, and repent. We can say read to proceed, reflect to connect, and repent to prevent. So the first thing is that one reads one reads, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi, madha? Al-Quran. So some of the scholars called this month of Ramadan the month of the Quran. So if one does not read the Quran on a regular basis, let's say 
you have not read a whole juz of the Quran the whole year. Or let's say you have not read the whole Quran in a month, or you haven't read the whole Quran this year. We're at different levels. We are at different levels. There's a story of the Quran you've never read before. You've never read this story. You've never actually read it from the Quran. You've read it from different books, but you haven't read it from the Quran itself. This month is the month to do that. This month is the month to put yourself in the Quran, to read the Quran, to increase yourself in reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you realize that when people come to Islam, when they find out that the Quran is the word of God, a lot of them are not concerned with anything else. Because when you take it back to the basics, they say, if that is what God is telling me, I want to know what he's telling me. Make it take, bring it back to the basics, brothers and sisters, to the basics. A lot of times we're immune to a lot of things that we encounter, whether it's work, whether it's our family, and the way that we act with them, the way that we act with our coworkers, we're immune to it. And we're immune to Islam and the Quran. But you should always detach yourself from these things to look at it to remind yourself of its virtue. Detach yourself from it. And that's what the Salah is for. That's what all the actions in Islam are for. To detach yourself from the tangible to remember what the intangible has told you about it. The tangible meaning, this life and what we can touch and feel and see. The intangible being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He is someone that we cannot see or touch physically. When He reminds you about these things, that's when you remember its virtue. And he reminds you about it through primarily what? The Quran. The Quran. Many of us, subhanAllah, when we were studying in the Medina, that we, you know, one of the things that a lot of students would do is, you know, when they first come, mashallah, they have this zeal, they want to learn, you know. So every lesson that they go to from the scholar, you know, the, the, the sheikh, They'll say, okay, Sheikh, what's the first book that we should study in this subject? What's the first book we should study in Creed? What's the first book in Hadith? What's the first book in Tafsir? I remember one time we asked this Sheikh and he said, uh, one student said, uh, Sheikh, okay, what's the first book that we should study in, um, in, in Aqidah? He said, the Quran. He said, what about Fiqh? He said, the Quran. He said, what about uh, Inheritance? The Quran. What about Hadith? The Quran. Every science in Islam goes back to the Quran. So when you think about it, how much are we indulging upon reading the Quran if it's the source of, the source of guidance? Islam is not Islam without the Quran. So what are we doing to take a piece of that treasure? To read it? For what purpose? To proceed. And that's what we say, read to proceed. To proceed on to the next level. And that next level is what? Reflection. You read the Quran for the purpose of reflection. For the purpose of reflection. And Allah confirms that in the Quran itself. When He says, Kitabun anzal nahu ilayka mubarakan liyadabbaru ayatihi wa liyatadhakkara ulul albab. Allah says in the Quran, the, the blessed Qur'an that we have revealed ilayka to you for what purpose? liyadabbaru to ponder over it and I mentioned this I think in a khutbah here to ponder over it and for the ones that have intellect or the ones that think ponder over these things to reflect to remember وَلِيَتَذَكَّرْ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ Let's just stop over this word ponder. When we look at the word ponder in English, what does ponder mean? Who can tell what ponder means? Preponderance, what is that? To think about something, right? For what reason? To derive the message to where hopefully you will internalize that message and the fruit of that message will come to life or it will grow, okay? But when we look in Arabic, it's much deeper. Allah says, liyadabbaru. The three letters in here, what are the three letters we? Yadabbar. 
from, from those who know Arabic. Dal, ba, ra. Dabr, right? And these, these three letters in Arabic generally mean the last part or the end of something. Like Ibn al-Abbas radiallahu anhu, he mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana fi dubur as-salati. He said when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was at the end of his prayer, he said dubur as-salah. At the end of his prayer, we should say, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. This is a hadith that the Prophet advised us to say at the end of our prayer, Oh Allah, help me. Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika. Help me in worshiping, remembering you. Or, or, or shukrika and being gratuitous towards you and worshiping you in a, in a good way. So we see that that means the end of something. So when we talk about tadabbur, tadabbur, when you increase the letters in the Arabic morphology, in the verbal structure, dabara is three letters, but tadabbur, tadabbur, you're adding two more letters. You're adding two more letters, okay? And as they say in Arabic, ziyadat al-mabna tadullu ala ziyadat al-ma'na. They say increasing the letters in a verb structure increases the meaning, the eloquence of the meaning. It may not have the direct meaning that you may understand. It has that direct meaning and much more. So when we say tadabbar or liyadabbaru means to ponder over what was recited to you. When we talk about pondering over it, where does the, where does the, what's the relevance of the end of something and pondering? As I mentioned before, if I said, okay, this person walked in the masjid and they're looking to their left and their right. They're looking to their left and their right. When they hear the word Allahu Akbar, they start to shiver. And they're walking closer to the sof and they're looking to their left and their right. And they look like they don't know what to do. As I'm telling you this, you're wanting to know, okay, what's next, right? And if I keep talking, I see he looked to his left and his right, then he stood in the sof. Then he raised his hand, when everyone raised his hand, he looked to his left and his right. You're basically going to say, Akhi, what's your point, Yaakhi? We're making, Akhi, iftar is coming. What's your point, right? What is the dubur of your kalam? What is the end of your statement? What are you alluding to? So when we read the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is he alluding to when we read it to where we can benefit from it, internalize it, process it, and act it out? That's much different than just reading it on a superficial level. Even though when you read it, you receive reward, no doubt about it. The ones that read and don't understand, you receive reward. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made that very clear. He said that I don't say that alif lam meme is one letter. But alif is one letter, meme is one letter, and alif is one letter, and meme is one letter. And these are 10 rewards and many more. But when one reads it, ponders over it, if one reads it in English and not in Arabic, to ponder over it, this is much greater. Much, much greater. Because you're pondering over it to think with, inshallah, the hopes of implementing. It's a big difference. So when we say reflect to connect, you're reflecting in order to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An example, just for the first two that we mentioned. The first one was read, right? And the second is what? Reflect. Or we can say read to proceed on to, reflect to connect. So we say read to proceed. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the young ones here? And when I say young ones, that means all of us because... In actuality, we all have a father and mother, and this verse is referring to that. What is this when Allah SWT speaks about speaking badly to the parents? What does he say, do not say? Do not say? Uff. Someone that speaks English may say, well, it doesn't apply to me because we don't say uff. That's not in our language. Is that correct? Because you know, as teenagers, teenagers, they have it all figured out. So they know that obviously, you know, early 20s too, they have it all figured out. So obviously this doesn't apply to them. Is that correct? Yes? So they can say other bad words to their parents. It's, it's halal. Yani. Allah said, uff. He said, don't say uff. But anything other than uff is fine. I know we're fasting, but bear with me. No? It's not okay. Okay? And this is a, a small academic benefit in Usul. This word uff, yes, it's 
uffed at what they said, but we understand the general meaning. Wara'uhu. The general meaning behind it is what? What's the general meaning? What is Allah trying to, art what is he articulating, not trying to, what is he articulating to you now? Wala tukul lahuma uffin. Yes. Talking back. Talking back. You don't, don't say anything that goes beyond their wishes. And on top of that can offend them. Whether it's uff or anything else. This is what I'm talking about. Pondering over this. But from an academic standpoint, they say, yes, okay, in this custom, it may not be uff. It may be suf. I don't know. In this custom, it may be... And another customer maybe, oh my God. Right? Oh my God. Really? Your mom says something, you say, really? Right? This is what we're talking about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that. So you've read it. You've understood it. Then the next thing you do is you reflect. A mirror does what? What does it do? Reflection. So you reflect. You put the Quran in front of you, then you stop and you say, okay. Yeah, my neighbor is like that. Is that how we do it? No. Oh yeah, the brother in the masjid. Allah Then you move on to the next verse. Allah guide him. I'm glad I'm not from that those types of people. No, you look at yourself. When my mother visited, when I spoke to the mother on my phone, when on the phone. And she was speaking about my brother. She's not happy with her son, my older brother. And I told her, Mom, just lay off. Leave, her, leave him alone. And I know that hurts her because she respects me when I speak to her. She really considers when I speak. I'm the oldest or I'm the youngest and I'm the baby. And I used to get away with saying a lot of things to her. But now I'm 50 or I'm 40 or I'm 60. And I still talk to her the same way. Therefore, she still treats me as her little baby. Look at yourself. Do I do things to my children that provoke them to say oof? Do I do things to my children that provoke them to say oof? Or to act in an oofing fashion? Look at yourself. After you've read it, you need to reflect over it on yourself. You need to reflect. When you reflect, after you reflect, we look at the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we reflect, we look at that statement or the, or, or the, the verse of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this verse is talking about reflection. When Allah mentions the, one of the most beautiful verses about the process of guidance. The process of what? Guidance. Guidance is made up of two things. Bear with me. We're talking about reflection. So guidance is made up of two things. An intellectual exercise and a spiritual exercise. Intellectual and ish? Spiritual. Because if it's too intellectual without the spiritual, one may say, you know, we don't really need God. We don't really need God to be moral. If it's too spiritual, one may say, you don't need to learn. Allah will just give you the knowledge. There's no exertion that has to be done. Allah will just give it to you. Right? The Spirit has told me. That's it. We don't need really sunnah on how to do these things. Allah knows. You have to join the two. And Allah mentions it in this verse. After Allah bin Lama Shaitan al Rajim, in the fi khalqa samawati wal ardi wakti la fi layli wal nahari, la ayat, layli wal nahar, la ayati li ulil albab. Verily, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day, there are signs for men of understanding. Alladina yadkuruna allaha qiyaman wa qurudan wa ala junubihim. The ones that remember Allah standing, sitting, and lying on their sides. And here is, here's the shahid, here's the portion. وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And they ponder, they think over the creation of the heavens and the earth. Then what did they say? رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا 
oh my Lord, you have not created this in vain. The moon and how it follows us everywhere we go. The sun right now and the heat that, it, that emits from it. There is no way that the human beings could have done this. Something beyond myself has done this. You have not created this in vain just for no reason. That a big bang just happened and it was all there. And if it was a big bang, you caused it to happen. That's the intellectual or spiritual exercise. Is that intellectual or spiritual? When you think you're looking at all the creations of God and you say this is impossible that man could have done this. There is no way that this is just this haphazard. This is orchestrated. It is precise. Intellectual exercise. After you know this, you see the power of God. You see the actions of God from creation. You see the actions of God from guidance from someone coming to Islam or a relative coming back to practicing. What's after that? رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَعْتِنْ سُبْحَانَكْ Glory to you. فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ then you say glory to you after you recognize God's properties, his values, what he's capable of doing, what he's capable of doing. Then you ask him because you know he's capable of it. This is one of the reasons why individuals such as myself came into Islam. There's no way that I believe that Jesus salam, brought me to life. There's no way that I can believe that he will forgive me of my sins if all the other prophets didn't do that. So you ask who is able. You ask who is able. So when you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do these things and everything under that and everything which you can imagine and that which you can't, then you ask him. Subhanak, you glorify him first and then you ask him to save you from the hellfire and that's the spiritual exercise. Both of those come together. This is the source of guidance. When someone comes into Islam, as we see with the companions, they go through this process. They go through this process. We see that with the companions, radiallahu anhum. So they reflect in order to connect. They reflect over God's actions and they connect with him by asking him his virtue, coming into Islam, coming back to the masjid, asking for his forgiveness, being nice to other individuals to hope for his reward. That's how they connect. That is how they connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the reflection that one must have in order to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we're busy in this dunya and we're doing things in this life and we know some of it is not virtuous, do we stop and reflect? Do we stop at night and look at ourselves and evaluate our lives and say, okay, what did I do that was not virtuous? What did I do that was? If it was virtuous, ask Allah to accept it. If it wasn't, ask Allah to what? Forgive. And that's the third one, repentance. Repentance. So we read, we reflect, then we repent. This is the process. We repent. Repentance. Repent. Repentance is to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Repentance acknowledges what about the human being? What does it acknowledge? That we're weak. What else? Flaws? That we have flaws. That the nature of man is weak. And Allah mentions that in the Quran. He's created weak. Right? And many of us forget the hadith of the Prophet. Many of us want to use this as an establishment, even though it's a very weak establishment, that uh, women are naqisat al aql, that they say the women are half, their intellect is half of intellect, right? Or deficient in their intellect, right? But the other half of the hadith expresses that she can seduce a man to where a man will fall weak to her. But we always forget that part of the hadith. Mankind is weak. Allah has put characteristics in a man that are not present in a woman and vice versa. And they need to join together to worship Allah in a more complete fashion. This concept of the relationship between man and woman is an amazing concept. And those that are married that are trying hard within their marriage, no. You have to be present with every incident that you have with your family member. 
and you will see the blessings, especially when you have a daughter, as a father that sits with his daughter, as a mother that sits with her son. You see certain characteristics within the male and within the female that when they come together, subhanAllah, is amazing. So repentance, brothers and sisters, is coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ghufran, ghufran, that has been mentioned, which is, some, is somewhat different than al-afu. Allah is al-afu, he is the partner, and he is also al-ghafur. He is the all-forgiving, and he is al-ghaffar also. So we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-ghufran, is to cover up the sin and erase the sin as though it never even happened. And al-afu is to pardon someone, right? If the brother, what's your name, brother? Muhammad. If Muhammad was to come up to me right now and say, Yaqi, it's 7 o'clock, I told you. He comes up, he snatches the microphone, he says, Yaqi, I told you, it's done. I'm bigger than you. What are you going to do? You know, I'm not making it to calf. Ramadan's almost over. I'll ask for forgiveness later. Okay? He takes it. And due to the fact that I'm making it to calf and I may be trying, I'll say, Alhamdulillah. Right? But will I remember it? Right? I will never come back here and give a lecture. Right? I'll remember it. I'll pardon him, but I'll remember it. And this reminds me of, um, subhanAllah, many of you, how many of you are familiar with, have been around camels? Camels. I'm in America asking this question, but. What is one amazing thing about the camel? Besides the humps and I mean. Sorry? They remember very good. Yes, what'd you say, brother? Their vendetta is nitroglycerin. They remember what you, especially to their children. If you harm a camel's child, if you harm a camel's child, a camel has a young boy, a young girl, you harm them, you whip them, you mistreat them. You humiliate sana, sanatain. They'll leave you alone for a year, two years. Then they'll come and they'll sit on you or something of the likes of that. They will they will take advantage of their vengeance upon you. And this is not like a Disney story. This is real. This is what takes with camels. With camels. And subhanAllah, I remember when I, I, I was told this by a Bedu, because I went, I stayed in Saudi Arabia for a while, so I was around, you know, the Bedus, and a lot of them, mashallah, you, you sit and talk with them, they're amazing also, because they can't read or write, but when you talk about Allah, due to the fact that they're out in the desert, in the wilderness, with the animals and no one else, you see how, subhanAllah, their tawheed is so strong. <laughs> the tawheed is so strong. And you see how Allah made the prophets. Some of them were what? Shepherds amongst the animals. For any of you that have animals, you see how Allah has created them. It's amazing, amazing, amazing. And we see within this one property, amongst many properties within the camels and other than the camels, that if you harm their children, a year will go by, brothers, and this is not exaggeration. I've heard a story of two years from the Bedu. Two years, they will come back and when they catch you, as we say, they catch you slipping, right? They catch you alone. They will come and they will have their vengeance. They'll sit on you. Because camels are very heavy, by the way, for those of you that don't know. They're very heavy, okay? They'll sit on you, right? So this is something, subhanAllah, that we see the vengeance of this animal coming back upon the person. They didn't forget. <laughs> they didn't forget. But when Allah forgives you, it's though the sin never happened. So one with this nature of being the deficient in nature, being that they have desires, but there are, there are hudud and there are boundaries that Allah has set, we understand that we will make mistakes if we read the first step to the process, we know that the Prophet ﷺ said, all of Bani Adam, all of the sons of Adam are what? Khattaun. He said that they all make mistakes. So he acknowledged already, Allah acknowledged via the Prophet ﷺ that we will all make mistakes. But then what did he say after that? And the best of those that make mistakes are the ones that what? Repent. Right? 
The same thing in the chapter of Al-Asr. Everybody is at loss, except those who do what? Yastathni, he makes an exception for those who believe, what? وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And do righteous deeds, and they call to the truth, and they call to patience. So repentance, brothers and sisters, being that you're in the masjid making i'tikaf, or you're here in these last 10 days, you're trying to embrace, you're trying to be present, be present with every moment in these last 10 days. Go through this process of reading and putting yourself in the Quran, reading the Quran, trying to absor absorb these stories in the Quran, looking at the meanings behind the stories. For instance, when we see Yusuf being thrown in the well, his brothers, when we see the, when I, if I was to say to you right now, the brothers of Yusuf, What's the first word that comes to your mind? Anyone? Jealousy. 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 Okay, so you've read, you've understood that. What's the next step? Reflect. What should one do after this? Okay, you read and you understood that his brothers were jealous. Now the next step is reflecting on that. And what do we say reflecting is? Reflect is to look at? Okay, so what do you do? Sorry? That's too general. Sorry? Be more general, be more specific. Think of a time when you were jealous of someone. Oh, I'm sorry, none of y'all were ever jealous of anyone ever in your life. I'm in the wrong masjid. Right, this is champions, question. Bottle, mashallah. Think of a time that you were jealous of someone. It may have been right before you picked up the Quran, and with the last predestination, you're reading that. You're reading that verse. They were. He said, they, they, and the brothers' jealousy led to what? Wanting to kill Yusuf. Right. So you reflect. You look at yourself. You be honest with yourself. You say, when was I jealous? And you're going to know when you were jealous. You're going to know. I'm not saying when did you act out that jealousy, but when was there an ounce? When was there mithqal khardal? When was there like a mustard seed of jealousy in your heart towards someone? That's, when, that's the reflection I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. You reflect and you look at yourself because this process of looking at yourself will make you humble, brothers and sisters. It will make you humble. You hold yourself accountable before you're held accountable. As they say, Salli qabl an alayk. Pray before you are prayed upon. So you look at yourself and you reflect. And then when you reflect, you say, Man, I was jealous of that. I was jealous of that brother. I was jealous of that sister. That's why I said, Well, you know, there are many people that are better than him. That's why I said, Yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah. And alhamdulillah was not a real alhamdulillah. He's like, yeah, alhamdulillah, he's okay. He's all right. He's not, you know. But you were really jealous. You, didn't, you despised the fact that he was being praised in your presence. You despised it. Or that she was being praised in your presence. Muslim or non-Muslim, doesn't matter. You just hate the fact of that. You do not like the fact that they have something that you don't. That's what you hate. Hasad. Right? So after you reflect, you're sitting by yourself, you're reading the Quran with the purpose of coming closer to Allah, then you say, oh Allah, take this jealousy out of my heart. Oh Allah, forgive me the next step. Repent. Repent to prevent. To prevent what? To prevent what? For it happening again. Even though you know you're deficient and it may happen again, but you're asking Allah to relinquish that from your heart, to relinquish that from your mind. And the way, the manifestation of that may be you making it to calf this year, maybe you sitting between Maghrib and Isha just to think about that the next day. Right? It may be someone praising you, which is a test for you. You're repenting. This is the process that I'm talking about. When you read, and it all started from just thinking, not even reading, just thinking about the brothers of Yusuf, me just proposing that to you. But when you read the story, you see how they first wanted to, uh, they despised Yusuf because of the love of their father for Yusuf and his brother, Benjamin, right? 
and then they wanted to kill him and what transpired from that which is a long story but just reading that story will lie every ayah you can look at yourself will lie you can look at yourself and say how does this apply to me what have i done concerning this verse this is what i'm talking about and i'tikaf brothers and sisters is one of the strongest means one of the strongest means of continuing this process on an hourly on a on a hourly basis especially i'tikaf in a master where people don't know you if you live in champions go to Maryam masjid on the south on sugarland if you live in Maryam come to champions i'tikaf sometimes should be a place where it's people you don't know and they're from houston because you want to be in a place to where you will not be distracted already mentally distracted you're going to be thinking about things okay what's my family doing now man what are the brothers doing now and what are the sisters doing now man i'm not i'm missing my tv show i'm missing this i'm missing that that's enough of distractions but then you have people coming to you and talking to you because they know you right especially at night when you're usually asleep at, after tarawih people want to talk to you right they want to talk to you it's not about haram but they just want to talk you find yourself talking an hour two hours about nothing Nothing beneficial. Nothing beneficial whatsoever. It's not haram, but it's not beneficial. It's not increasing you. Rather, it's harming you. I'tikaf is for the purpose of what? Shadad al mi'zar. To have your undivided attention. It is not easy. It is like a boot camp. It's, it's on top of Ramadan, on fasting. It's on top of that. And I'll end with the three hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, we, just to conclude, we covered reading, reflecting, and repenting. Reading, reflecting, repenting. Reading, reflecting, and repenting. You read in order to reflect, and you reflect with hopes of repenting. And that repenting is order to prevent you from doing evil deeds. And brothers and sisters, that is exactly what the verse is mentioning here. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Shah Ramadan. Uh, uh, we talked about the, the obligation of Ramadan. Kutiba alaykum musiyamu kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. For you to have God, to be God fearing or have God consciousness. And that consciousness causes you to fear Him. The consciousness, the reflection causes you to fear Him. And as I say, taqwa comes from waqiya. And waqiya means what? Protection. Protection. Wiqaya. As they say in Arabic, a wiqaya, khayrun min al-ilaj. They say that prevention is better than cure. Prevention is before the ailment. Inshallah, you prevent yourself to, you will not encounter that ailment to where you have to go for the cure. But due to the fact that you are naturally you're a human being and you've been jealous before, you've pondered over it, then you repent. But the next time you're trying to do actions of prevention, the next time you hear that person, you say, MashaAllah, that's good, that's good. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him. May Allah increase him. But in yourself, there's a jihad in nafs. You're fighting yourself. One easy way to relinquish yourself from jealousy as a side point is to think of the things that Allah has given you. And always remember that that person has a deficiency that Allah has not exposed. Just as he has not exposed your deficiency. So remembering these three brothers and sisters, we end with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says, Man sama Ramadan imanan wahtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambi. Man qama Ramadan imanan wahtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambi. من قام ليلة القدر إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه. If you don't know Arabic, I know you understood that, right? It's very easy. The first hadith was whoever stands in the month of Ramadan with iman and anticipation, and I'll explain that. Whatever comes before his sins has been forgiven, his previous sins have been forgiven. Whoever prays or whoever, uh, excuse me, fasts, fasts in the month of Ramadan 
with faith, with iman and anticipation, his previous sins are forgiven. Third hadith. Whoever stands the night of the Qadr, Laylatul Qadr, with iman and anticipation, his previous sins will be forgiven. Those are the three hadith. Remember, memorize the hadith, brothers and sisters. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Imanan and Ish, Ihtisaban. With Iman and with what? Very important. I'm going to touch on these and then that will end, inshaAllah. This is very important. With Iman. Iman comes from Amin. And Amin is to have security. So when you have this belief in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, you believe in His names and His attributes. You have faith and surety that He is the one that forgives. That He is the only one that forgives, for example. You have this sense of security in your heart. You have no fear. Allah is al-Nasir, al nasir right? He is the one that helps and assists. He helps and assists in times of calamities. So with what's going on with the brothers and sisters in Syria, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist the brothers and sisters all over the world. Ameen. So when we think about that, we don't give up what? Hope. We have a sense of security and surety. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist those people that He wants to assist. And death may be an assistance for them. So we have to think outside always of our peripheral and understand that the power of Allah cannot be domesticated. The power of Allah cannot be confined to our intellect only because our intellects, they, they, they range in this very room. But we know that it is infinite. When we understand this about Allah's power in any attribute, power, anger, love, strength, all of these are attributes and all of these have names. We know that there are no limits. When we understand that, that brings a sense of security. And that is Iman. That is what Iman is. Imanan. So when we talk about the month of Ramadan, we know that Allah has obliged it upon us and we fast the month of Ramadan with Iman in Him. We know that he is obliged and we do it because he has made it obligatory. But we understand the relationship of obligation. Allah obliges something on you for what reason? For his benefit? For your benefit. And we understand that this is wajib and this is not because this is a stronger means to get closer to Allah. This is a stronger means to make you a better Muslim. So someone that does not pray Isha but prays Taraweeh, our priorities are mixed up, right? This is what I'm talking about. Someone that may have a store and they sell liquor and they have nothing in their heart towards doing that and they don't pray but they eat the biha, our priorities are mixed up. You have left off a pillar of Islam. This is what I'm referring to. But we are not here to judge anyone. But the most important thing is that we go through that process that we mentioned earlier. So Iman. And then Ihtisaban. Anticipation. As they say in Arabic, which is beautiful, I want to say in Arabic, it makes it very good sense in English. That they say that Ihtisaban is غير مستثقل في صيامه وغير مستطيل في أيامه that the person when you anticipate something you are waiting for that event to happen so if you have iman and belief that Allah has obliged us and I understand why he's obliged us because fasting is a for example fasting is one of the strongest means to obtain sincerity it's one of the strongest means to think about his actions upon me. It's one of the strongest means for me to act according to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If I am present with it, if I have my undivided attention. Ihtisaban, I am anticipating and hoping for the reward. There was one time I was in Al-Madinah, SubhanAllah, and it was puzzling in the beginning. 
Every year in the Medina, we see the people that come and make Hajj. You know, we, 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 we're at the hotels and we see brothers as yourself. And, you know, mashallah, we get them together with the people of knowledge and mashallah. So there was one time the, the Hajj was over. And the brother came in. A brother, another student introduced his brother to me. And the brother, may Allah, may Allah forgive him and forgive us. I mean, we said, how was your Hajj? He said, I'm glad it's over, man. I'm just glad it's over. <laughs> And he went on, we just, and I was quiet, it was puzzled. He said, only reason I did it is because Allah said it's wajib. That's the only reason I did it. Other than that, I'm glad it's over. Man. I'm done with it. Right? So it was puzzling because, okay, he said he did it because it's wajib, which is a good thing. But then his attitude towards hajj in general. Complaining, complaining, right? That's what is meant by ihtisaban, anticipating the reward. When we fast the first couple of days is difficult. And some of you may see in your children's faces, and hopefully not in yours, wajhun <laughs> abus. That your face is like, you, you don't want no one to talk, you don't want to be talked to. You don't want no one to say anything to you. Because if someone says something to you, what, what, right? What are you good? What, what, what do you want? Right? You don't want to talk to anybody. Inshallah, your coworkers don't know when you're fasting from that aspect, <laughs> right? <laughs> Allah, what's that? May Allah forgive us. Stuff Allah, right? That's what they meant when they say that, that you don't make the fasting heavy upon yourself to where it's a burden on you. When you're fasting, do you feel it's a burden on you? This is reflection. You ask yourself this question. Do you feel it's a burden on you? To where I know I'm doing because, man, I really do. If it was up to me, I wouldn't do it. Ask yourself. If it was up to me, man, I would not be doing this. Right? Why do you think the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he's from, this is another sign that he was from mankind. Why do you think that he would fast in the month before Ramadan? Why do you think that one of the, one of the wisdoms behind it is to prepare yourself every Monday and Thursday, to prepare yourself to when Ramadan comes and you know you have to do it, you don't say things like that. You don't have a facial expression like that. You don't have the feeling of, of hatred like that. That's ihtisabin. غير مستطيل في أيامه And you don't feel, man, this is a long, man, when is iftar coming in? God, I'm, this is, I've had it already. Right? The time where you, subhanAllah, the time where you should be making a lot of dua, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're just thinking about the samosa. Bas. Or the falafel, or the fried chicken, you know, Whatever it may be, or the date, that's all you're thinking about. Let's be honest, we're human beings. And that is the jihad nafs, that's the fighting, fighting yourself. You know, you're sitting at the sofa, you're sitting at the table, and they're talking about, man, did you have that iftar last night? Where's the best iftar? Man, they have this food at this other iftar over there at the other masjid, Aki, subhanAllah. And this is like 10 minutes before the iftar, you're talking about food. You're talking about food, right? You're hoping for the reward. To where when the month of Ramadan is leaving, what goes through your mind? Man, I am glad that this is over. Why are you glad that it's over? Why are you glad it's over? This is what you have to ask yourself. Even with, even with, with me, it was very, when I first came Muslim, it was like, people are not going to eat and drink, and they're happy about it. <laughs> They're happy about not eating it. It's, some, it's something beyond feeling full here. I'm missing something. I guess I'll get it the more I read the, the Quran. Right? It's something beyond that. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever doesn't leave off jahiliyyah and illicit speech and talking, then Allah is not in need of his what? leaving off his eating and his drinking. Right there you understand it goes beyond the eating and the drinking. So when you see people that may not be Muslim and they say, we want to fast with you. We want to feel what you are feeling. Or they like the organization of fasting. Some of them may be into fitness and they know intermittent fasting. 
insulin and it's a healthy thing for you to gain muscle and lose fat, etc. They've left off the first part, imanin, mefi. The iman is not there. So the forgiveness of their sins will not apply. So we understand, brothers and sisters, the, the hadith, and I'll repeat them in conclusion. من قام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبي. Whoever stands a month of Ramadan with iman, with belief and anticipation, Allah will forgive him of his previous sins. من صام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبي. Whoever fasts a month of Ramadan with iman and anticipation of his reward, his previous sins will be forgiven. من قام ليلة القدر إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه and whoever stands on the night of Qadr the Laylat al Qadr with the belief and the iman and anticipation his previous sins will be forgiven his previous sins will be forgiven and if you realize it brothers and sisters you fall into at least one of these three and inshallah all of them and the one that doesn't fall into one of these three we see the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam where he mentions uh, the person that fasts or he mentioned the extra dua that the Jibril made a dua to the Prophet وسلم, that the person that fasts that there is no hope for him the one that fasts and there was no reward for him fasting none whatsoever none whatsoever and he told the Prophet وسلم, say Ameen and the Prophet وسلم, said Ameen so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who stand in this month of Ramadan with Iman وحتساباً. with Iman and with anticipation of his reward we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those three qualities that Aisha said that he had undivided attention that he was someone that live in his night and he was someone that awakened his family to participate in one of the greatest in the greatest nights in the whole year the nights of the ten nights of Ramadan we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who keep our eyes on the prize and to focus on this month of Ramadan in these last 10 days and increasing in our actions and to exert ourselves like we've never exerted ourselves before. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakallah khair.